Hey there, listeners. If you haven't already, download the Stay Current in Pediatric Surgery app, but don't get too used to it. There's a new version of it coming out, soon to be released, way more intuitive interface, a lot of interesting content. I think you guys are going to love it. But until then, enjoy the podcast. Chicago, the Windy City. I think we all have some great memories of this town, but Todd Ponsky has a memory of Chicago that I think is going to haunt him for the rest of his career. Take a listen. Actually, don't know what year it was. And I was giving a lecture at the annual fellows course. I think it was at this year. I think it was in Chicago. And my talk was supposed to be on Empaima. And I stood up in front of the whole room and I said, let me talk you through the steps of a VATS. Someone, I think it was Dan Osley, I don't remember, raised their hand and said, why are you talking about VATS? And I said, why, isn't that, what do you mean? They go, well, what about TPA? I said, well, who does that? And the entire room raised their hand. So literally, I was the only one that didn't know how to treat empyema and I was the one giving the lecture. So uh, I will never forget that embarrassing day of how I realized that everyone was doing it. I'm Rod Gerardo from Cincinnati Children's, and to make sure that you don't feel like Todd did all those years back, let's talk about TPA, Empyema, and VATS. This is a story that is something like 12 years in the making, so let's go back to that time. 2008. Between my junior and senior year of fellowship, when we were having this discussion, and we were convinced that that was the primary mode of treating empyema. And there were patients who were being sent to IR for fibrinolysis, and, and they seemed to be doing okay as well. That is Dr. Sean St. Peter. He's the surgeon in chief at Children's Mercy, Kansas City, and he's also the PI on a recent article called Declining Frequency of Thoroscopic Decortication for Empyema, Redefining Failure After Fibrinolysis. Just so that we're all on the same page here, empyema is an infection between the lung and the inside of the chest wall. So traditionally, it was treated with a VATS, or a video-assisted thoracoscopic surgery. We go in with a little camera, little tools, kind of clean up all the infection, get out any clots. Then TPA came around, or tissue plasminogen activator, and it's a clot buster. We found that if we put a little bit of that in, that can break up some clots too. But which one's better? We designed a randomized trial using um, the difference in length of stay that we had already found in our retrospective experience between VATS and fibrinolysis. So we worked together with our interventional radiologists, came up with a protocol uh, based on what they do and based on what we do, and then we started to randomize patients. And as that study progressed, what struck me is that the kids that were getting fibrinolysis, they didn't get sicker. Uh, We were left with, it appears that VATS is equivalent to fibrinolysis, but one's an operation and one's not. Interesting, but did they have enough evidence to support that? With a 36-patient study, 18 observations was not enough. So we used that protocol without changing anything over the next 100 and I think four or five patients. But that was our, our next publication was how, how, how does that function and how do people do when they fail fibrinolysis and they need an operation? Because now it should theoretically be more bloody, more stuck. And what we found, the results were the exact same. Length of stay was the same. They functioned just as well. The failure rate was still one in six, except um, we found that if you had your operation after fibrinolysis, you did not do worse. You actually did better than the patients in the primary VATS group from the original study. So they, they start getting better from their pneumonia, then they get their VATS, then they end up having a shorter course after that. So the more they looked into the data, the more it seems like TPA might be the real deal. That got us to thinking this failure rate is coming from what we consider a failure, which is based on these algorithms. And if somebody's got a fever for four days, that doesn't matter because they're going to have a fever for four weeks. It's because of their parenchymal disease. And even then you would ask yourself the question, what's keeping them in the hospital? 
And so then we start to say failure should be the person who can't eat and still remains on oxygen. So in other words, they can't meet their feeding goals, can't get off oxygen. They have to stay in the hospital. So we have to do something for them. And at that point, we get advanced imaging and take a look. Is this all parenchymal disease? And sometimes that's what we find. We find pulmonary necrosis. We don't even find pleural disease. We've treated the pleural disease and their illness isn't something that we can treat surgically. Sometimes you find that there is pleural disease, but instead of going straight to an operation, let's take a look at those remaining loculations, maybe put in a new tube if there's undrained stuff, or go ahead with another round of TPA and be patient. Once we started doing that, our failure rate started to tank precipitously. So then this last publication that just came out this month in JPS took a look at that most recent experience. And what we found is our failure rate was now down to 4%, but we haven't had one in four years. Wait a second. None of their patients failed TPA in the past four years? And now I find it interesting that I started this journey with a strong bias that VATS was clearly superior, conducted these studies with a protocol in place where we couldn't influence the management and let the protocols do the talking. And now I'm in a position that I may not do the operation again. So 12 years ago, Dr. St. Peter and his team thought that they were going to have all this proof that VATS was superior. And now looking at all the data and all the publications that they've done, as DJ Khaled would say, congratulations, you played yourself. Once curio- I mean, once uh, conviction replaces curiosity, and that, that's where growth stops. Uh, this is sort of a story of that, where we were completely convinced we had the right therapy. And now uh, I think that therapy is going away because of our work. There's no way we were going to get through this Zoom call without Todd having some questions too. When I read the article, I needed to call you to explain to me why this was so important. Um, I, you know, I call, I said, tell me what it is about this article, why you think this is game changing? Because when I see an article with your name, I say, okay, this has got to be important, but I don't get it. Why is this an important article? The reason is because the, the protocol that we were all living from was this idea that if you continued to not have clinical improvement, then repeat ultrasound. And if there's persistent pleural space disease, you go on to VATS. Where we've moved to now is that if there's persistent pleural space disease, then take a look at what needs to be drained and what needs repeat TPA. And if there's limited pleural space disease, then, then just be patient. Tell me if this, I got the summary right here. Before this article, we showed that you, you could do fibrinolysis or VATS. They have about the same outcomes. Is that at least same, same length of stay, same length of stay. But now you're saying keep persisting. That's after this article, what I, my change in practice is keep persisting. You do TPA, they're not getting better. Image them and TPA them again. And they, and you do that and they're not getting better. Image them and TPA them again. Keep persisting because you think that ultimately, no matter what, when at any point in time, when you switch to the VATS arm, it's not going to do any better for them. That's right. As you continue to go down that branching algorithm, you would, you would have to have a substantial amount of solid pleural space disease that TPA is not affecting. And we haven't seen that patient in the last four years. And we're a relatively high volume hospital. Not saying it doesn't exist. Not saying that the rule could never be there. There's, there's always nuance to these clinical conditions. But for your typical patient with empyema, once you start down that path, if you pull the trigger and, and go to VATS, you now have a more expensive course, but you're not going to decrease their length of stay or decrease their morbidity. So patience, it's a virtue. And probably the main point of this article when it comes to TPA, it's just something that I don't think Todd is very good at. I want to make sure I understand this. Patient comes in, they have empyema. You place a drain. Who places the drain? You do or IR does? IR does. IR places the drain. TPA is given by you, by the floor nurses, by the ICU, who? It, so that's evolved. It used to be our service specifically. And now I think IR has enough help with their NPs that they're able to, um, okay. they're able to send people up to do that. Then you <clears throat> infuse the TPA. Um, at what dose, how often? These are rapid fire questions. So at what dose, how often? Four milligrams into 40 mils of saline, regardless of patient size. 
And how often? Uh, we do that once a day. Once a day for three days? Yep, including the time of placement usually. So it's over 48 hour period. Wait, wait, what do you mean in, including the time of placement? So you put it in, you infuse it and you suck it back out? No, it's a, it's a dwell time of an hour. So what if they're in IR, which they typically are, they're gonna put in their needle, they're gonna suck out everything that they can. They're gonna place their wire, they're gonna put their pigtail in, and then they're gonna infuse their TPA after they've gotten out the fluid component, and then there'll be a clamp placed and that gets removed in an hour. So yeah, yeah, then the next right. one's at 24 hours, the third one's at 48 hours. So when people Got hear it. three doses, 24 hours apart, they think three days. But if, if the first time crunch is, is at zero, then that takes you to the end of day two. Got it. And then you assess if they're eating and off of oxygen. And if not, you re-image them? So no, at three days, that's when you just leave the chest tube, stop TPAing it, and then follow it for the next couple of days, which is what we did before. We'd follow them for three or four days and see if they got better from there. There isn't a fixed protocol like 48 hours or 72 hours. It typically goes with clinical flow. And you can imagine this because when we used to operate early, there would be these huge solid chunks that we'd be pulling out and you'd be thinking, how could you ever treat this? And I think what happens is that you treat a lot of that, that liquefied disease early for the people who end up having re recurrent two placement. And then that other stuff softens up, starts to break away from, from the lung. You get more fluid mixed in there that's being created by the pleural space. And so then in a couple of days after you finish the TPA, now they can suck out a bunch more fluid, get into another pocket and then finish the job. That's what we found out is that an, an, another trip to TPA and they'll even put their needle in and break up septations and then suck out some fluid before they place their drain. What it turns out is that that's just as effective as our five millimeter graspers when we would go to the OR and do that. Would you ever consider going, when would you go to VATS? I would go to VATS and somebody who has a large burden of pleural space disease who isn't getting better. And that's a patient we haven't seen in, in, in over four years. So there you have it. More data is collected, analyzed a little bit differently. Just like that, the treatment for empyema becomes a little bit less morbid. So next time you're in a big lecture hall and someone like Todd is about to walk you through the steps of a VATS, don't be afraid to raise your hand like Dan Osley did and question them. More data is coming out to say, you might be right. If you're listening to this podcast on anything other than our Stay Current app, you're missing out on so much content. You've got to download this app. We've got guidelines, technique videos, video casts, more podcasts like this, and a group of thousands of other pediatric surgeons you can have a conversation with in our app. So download it for... Apple iOS or Android. Thank you for listening. And remember, knowledge should be free.